Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome to Truth Legal's fifth podcast. Today I have with me Tom Hatley of Christopher Little & Co Financial Advisors. Hello Tom. Hi Andrew. Thanks for coming in today. So Tom, tell us about yourself. Uh, where do you work? What do you do? Who are you? Uh, I'm Tom Hatley. I'm a Financial Advisor at Christopher Little & Co. And we're based in Otley, which is near Leeds, and we offer financial advice to clients in a local area. Super, thank you very much. Now, the purpose of today's podcast is for our clients to assist them in knowing what to do so before an accident takes place. Now, of course, no one knows when an accident's gonna take place, but it's, it seems a good idea to me to advise our clients uh, about their financial situation well in advance of anything going wrong in their lives. What advice would you give when you normally see a client? Well, Andrew, there's a number of things clients can do and obviously like you say there's there's no crystal ball so you don't know exactly when you might have an accident or be off work but it's really all about getting your finances in order so that way you can be best prepared should the worst happen. Uh, so for example you could have a good understanding about what your committed and discretionary outgoings are. Sure. That way if you're off work um, obviously if your employer doesn't pay you whilst you're off or you're self-employed, you actually understand what the mortgage is every month, what the utility bills are. Um, and if you've got some savings, you can know how long those savings might last. And probably when you meet your clients, is it a bit of a surprise to them when you work out what their actual outgoings are? Yeah, it is. Um, often we find that it's a mix. Some clients have everything detailed on a spreadsheet and they know every uh, little penny that's going out and that's fantastic. They would have a clear idea, obviously, that their committed outgoings might be, say, £1,000 a month. Uh, that might be made up of their mortgage, accounts or tax, utility bills, Sky TV, of course. And then their discretionary outgoings as well. So that's really about living, isn't it? It's, it's about going out, having holidays. And for the clients that understand what that is, um, they can actually appreciate if, if they were unable to work and they weren't getting paid what impact that's likely to have on them financially when they won't be able to afford to pay that mortgage anymore. All good advice, but how many months or years worth of savings should the ideal person have, if there is an ideal? Uh, yeah, there is. There's, we usually say at least three to six months. Um, and that can depend on people's circumstances and things like what their employer sick pay policy is. Uh, so if we take an example like a teacher, uh, they're likely to have uh, a sick pay policy where they're paid for between six and 12 months if they're unable to work yes. due to accident and injury. Whereas if we take a, a self-employed plumber, for example, um, if he's uh, fallen off a ladder or had an accident and, and he can't go to work anymore, um, he's got no income apart from some invoices that he might have to or, send out. Or perhaps a personal injury claim coming his direction. Indeed, indeed. So when you say so three to six months, surely it can be extended if people cut their cloth accordingly and perhaps reduce their expenditure. So the Sky TV goes out the window and they, they're no longer using Deliveroo's and Domino's pizzas and they're cooking rather boring meals in-house. Is that what you say to people that have found themselves on hard times? Well, absolutely. People that find themselves in hard times, they don't have any choice. But hopefully before the event, when you're sitting down and you're talking to to an individual about this, this scenario, they don't want to give up their Domino's Pizza or the Sky Telly, they're actually quite attached to those things. So really it's, it's about planning ahead um, and what we try to advise clients on is what they can put in place to help them should the worst happen and they be off work due to accident or injury. Now of course the teacher's scenario is likely to have a decent uh, sick pay provision in their contract uh, being a, pu a public sector worker. But for those that uh, perhaps work in the private sector, they're entitled to statutory sick pay, I think. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about statutory sick pay? Yeah, statutory sick pay, um, it's £89.35 a week. So it's not a lot at all. Um, and then longer term, if you're off, you move on to Employment Support Allowance, or ESA. Um, and that's either £73.10 a week or slightly more, £109.65 a week if you're in a support group. So the state benefits are really minimal. And if you think about the average mortgage, and as I mentioned earlier, those committed outgoings, things that you can't turn off, typically you'd be looking at around maybe a thousand pounds a month as a minimum. Uh, the statutory uh, payments from the government aren't going to touch that. So really people need to think about what else can we do 
to prepare and make sure if the worst happens, we've got some financial security blanket. Okay, and on that financial security blanket point, is there insurances which you'd recommend to the financial advisor to people at any stage in their life, uh, which could perhaps provide them with income if something does go wrong? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's three main types of insurance that um, our financial advisors will talk to clients about. Uh, there's, there's life insurance, critical illness cover, and income protection. And today, we're really talking about the third one, income protection. Uh, that product is designed, or that insurance policy, is designed to pay you a regular income if you're unable to work. Uh, and the policies vary greatly. You need to make sure that you're, you're taking out the right policy for your circumstances. How, how would you ensure you're going in the right policy? Was it just a question of going online onto one of those compare the market type products? Or did they really need to sit down with a financial advisor and go through the best options? Well, we'd of course say that you should sit down with a financial advisor and go through the options. But the, the key reasons for that are the different features and options when taking out these policies are, are enormous. So for example, <clears throat> if you're a teacher, and let's say you're entitled to, to sick pay for 12 months, you would probably be looking at uh, an income protection policy that would only start to pay you a regular income after 12 months. It okay. wouldn't be any good taking out a, an income protection policy that starts paying you after three months. And in such circumstances, would the teacher be on their full pay and for roughly for how long or is it a percentage of their usual pay? Uh, in terms of um, the employer sick pay, it'll be dependent on, on, on what the employer offers. So often it's, it's full pay for a certain period, maybe six months, then it might drop to half pay. With income protection, the, the policies are usually set to a percentage of your gross income. So if we were to keep things extremely simple, let's assume someone's earning £10,000 a year, okay? Yes. Now most income protection insurance policies will insure you for 60, 65% of that income. So you'd be able to cover yourself for six, six and a half thousand pounds a year. For how long, typically? For how long? Well, usually we'd advise for clients to have the policy through to their retirement because unfortunately there are instances where people do get injured and it's serious and they're unable to return to work ever. So in that situation, uh, you want a policy that's going to make sure you've got that regular income for the rest of your working life or what would have been your working life. Well, surely the premium for insurance at that level is pretty spectacularly high and affordable for the average man and woman on the street. No, it's, it's quite surprising really. It depends on a number of factors. Um, as you would imagine, uh, age, the older you are, the more it costs because the likelihood of you making a claim is higher. Well, the length of time though until retirement would be shorter though, conversely. Yes, yes it would, but generally premiums are higher because most people would claim on this type of policy probably in their 50s. Uh, so, so age, the older you are, unfortunately, the, the, the higher the premiums are. The other aspects which impact on how much it costs are what we call the deferred period. So if you're that lucky teacher um, and you've got sick pay through your employer for 12 months, you would set your deferred claim period on a policy for 12 months. Therefore, the premium is going to be lower because you're not going to be costing the insurance company any money for the first year that you're off work. And, and for anyone listening to this show, if they're going online to one of those compare the market type uh, uh, websites, will that be easy for them to obtain this deferred style policy? Or is that something that you, is quite bespoke and requires financial advisor input? Uh, going on to a comparison site, all the same features are available, but it's really about do you understand these features? So do you understand what deferred period you require? Do you understand what percentage of your salary can be covered? Uh, sometimes people can be overinsured, believe it or not. Okay. So if you take that example of that person that's earning £10,000 a year, if their salary was to reduce to £5,000 a year, they would no longer be able to claim that £6,000 on the insurance policy. So they're effectively overinsured and paying for cover that they can't claim on. So it's a really important point, I believe, that instead of going online and doing it yourself, you at least sit down with a financial advisor 
who understands these types of products and can recommend a policy that's best for your circumstances. I understand. As a claimant solicitor, I spend most of my day uh, suing insurance companies <laughs> and therefore I am a little bit dubious that the insurance companies always pay out when someone has had an accident and they are covered. Um, do the insurance companies play hardball when it comes to payments or in your experience or is that a myth uh, propagated by the likes of claimant solicitors such as myself? <laughs> well, I wouldn't like to say it but I'm going to. It's, it's often a myth but that's only in my experience and that's largely because the uh, insurance providers that we would recommend would only be reputable companies with good claim records. We could actually sit down with a client and show them what the claim stats are for an insurance provider. And it's another good point actually that you make, Andrew. When people go online, there's a whole host of different insurance providers. If I think of when I renew my car insurance, there's companies I've heard of and companies I haven't. Now the ones that you perhaps haven't heard of, they might not cover pre-existing conditions. Okay. So. Therefore, you need to be aware of that. And let's be honest, these insurance documents are extremely lengthy. Yes. And we don't always sit and read every term and condition. So that's where the financial advisor would come in again. You know, it's their responsibility. And you put the onus and the responsibility on their shoulders to make sure the policy works for you. So all the providers we recommend uh, would cover pre-existing conditions. You go through um, a medical questionnaire where you disclose everything. And in our experience, when the likes of an Aviva, a Legal and General, a Royal London, these big insurers, when they don't pay out, it's for very good reason. And the number one reason is often non-disclosure. So that's where the client might have had um, some heart problems and they haven't put it down on the application, they haven't told the insurer, and then they have some further heart problems, they try and make a claim and you know, quite rightly the insurance company is going to check with their GP records and medical records and, and they're not going to pay out a claim in that instance. So how quickly typically would an insurer pay? For example, if someone has an accident today and they have one of these policies which uh, you're recommending, um, how quickly can they get their income or the percentage of their income paid by their insurers? Assuming there's no problem of course with how they've filled in their forms and so on. Uh, typically you're looking at a matter of weeks. Wow, okay. So. Often um, policies are paid in arrears, so if, if you've got a deferred claim period of, go back to our example, of 12 months, by the end of the 13th month, hopefully the insurance policy uh, would, have, would have paid out and that income will start coming in. Because you would have been off work, you would have known about your injury, you can start to complete the, the claim application form, you can get it in as soon as possible. Uh, the insurance providers, uh, they don't want to hang around, they want to get these things dealt with. Um, and, and they know that their reputation's on the line. Uh, they right. don't want any bad headlines, they want to pay out legitimate claims. So, so yeah, you're looking at a matter of weeks. Changing direction somewhat. When one of our clients receives a cheque, for example a cheque for, let's say, £10,000 in result of an accident, perhaps an accident to work or a road traffic accident, what impact roughly would there be on someone's benefits position, assuming that they were on benefits or before the accident? Uh, well, in terms of their benefits, uh, any monies they have in the bank are obviously going to be taken into consideration. Um, so I don't have the exact figures in front of me today, but you need to bear in mind that if the money's sat in your name and it's in the bank, you're going to need to declare that to the benefits agency and that might have an impact on the state benefits you're able to claim. So in a way, are you saying that someone putting a personal injury claim and receiving a lot of money it's not such a good idea that they put a claim in at all and they're going to be in a worse off position. Is that uh, your advice or is there a way around it in terms of trusts? Uh, you can certainly uh, work a way around it, uh, something called a personal injury trust. Uh, that's effectively where uh, the money doesn't stay in your name, it goes into uh, a trust. And, and that's almost like another entity. Um, it's, it's not owned by you directly, but you're called what's a trustee. Uh, so you have control over the money. But in terms of when uh, the, the state benefit officer would sit down with you and go through the benefits that are available, or these days when you're doing it online, hmm. um, you effectively wouldn't write down that you've got £10,000 in the bank because that money isn't held by you, it's held by a trust. Um, so, so there is a work around it and I'd certainly recommend you do <laughs> go and seek advice um, uh, with regards to personal injuries. Okay, Tom, so what are your top tips that you would say to any client that comes to see you when it comes to working out their outgoings and what sort of insurance products that they have? 
is it as simple as just pay off credit card and mortgage as soon as you can or have you got some greater words of wisdom for <laughs> the listeners? Well I really think it's just about summarising what we've said. Um, so first of all, understand what your outgoings are, break it down between committed and discretionary outgoings. Understand that having some savings in the bank is a good idea and ideally you want at least six months committed outgoings in the bank so should you be off work and you've got no income you can afford to keep paying those bills whilst hopefully you can get back on your feet. Uh, and then thirdly, um, to put a real financial safety blanket in place, you should consider taking out some income protection insurance. So for the long term, if you are off sick, you've got money coming in. And by the way, that money is tax free. Okay. It's worth pointing that out. Wow. Now, you, the way you speak about financial matters, which I must say I find a little bit dry and boring, you speak about it with such passion. Now, why do you actually enjoy your job, assuming you do? What's the best bit about your job? Uh, the best bit about my job is seeing clients put in a better financial situation and maximising their wealth. And ultimately, that means that they get to do the things that they want to do in life. Uh, so, you know, going back to talking about what we are today, personal injury, it doesn't have to be all doom and gloom. You know, unfortunately, life happens and people can end up um, with a personal injury, but that doesn't mean that they can't have a continued income and still have a good quality of life. So uh, the part of my job that I enjoy is uh, helping to deliver clients with a better lifestyle through the financial planning. And how do our listeners find out much more about you, Tom? Oh, well, that's really easy. Uh, they can go on our website, which, which is, is www.christopher-little.co.uk. Uh, or they can just go onto any of the search engines like Google and put in Christopher Little and Co and we will come up. Thank you very much. Any other words of wisdom or has that exhausted everything that you have to tell us all? I think that just about covers everything for today. Uh, thanks for having us in. Pleasure. Thank you, Tom. Good luck with your business. Thank you.